Well, good morning, Compass Bible Church. It is so good to be with you. And if you have no clue who I am, I had the incredible honor of being one of the pastors here from 2009 to 2018. Just some incredible years here at this church. Met my wife here at this church. Uh, so grateful for the time I was able to spend here. And then in 2018, this church sent me uh, up to just outside of Boise, Idaho to plant a church. And about 20 families moved from here in South Orange County up there to Idaho. And so sometimes when you think of a church plant, you think of you know a few families huddled together in a living room uh, trying to start a church. No, we, we started as a small church with about 200 people come in every Sunday. And as you heard Pastor Doug earlier, now every Sunday morning there's over a thousand souls gathering uh, to hear the word of God. And it's incredible to see what he is doing. People have gotten saved through our church. And so many people, uh, so many people moving there to Idaho, most of our church, if you, if you were in our church service this morning and you took a show of hands and you said, how many of you didn't live here over six years ago? Most of the room would be raising their hands. So for a lot of people, it's just a new church. And, and one thing we hear a lot is, I, I didn't know that you could really build the church just around teaching the Bible. <laughs> and we say, you can, it's actually recommended. Uh, <laughs> that you do it that way. And you think of the distinctives of Compass Bible Church. The Bible is central, number one. We showcase expository preaching, and those are the things we want to be all about in Idaho. And I firmly believe when churches are resolved to live those things out, God will bless that because people are hungry for the Word of God. There is nothing like it. So from the bottom of my heart, and from really the hearts of many people who you have never met and may never meet in this world, thank you Compass Bible Church, Aliso Viejo, we are so grateful for you, and I know how it looks having been here on your end of planning a church, and that can be painful sometimes, and you say goodbye to people that you love as they move somewhere else, and they're a part of another congregation, and that can hurt, but I just want to tell you that hurt is worth it, because this morning, there is a healthy, thriving church meeting in another state reaching all kinds of new people that would not be there if it wasn't for the sacrifice and the generosity of this church. So I am so grateful for this church. I'm so thankful for this pulpit, for Pastor Mike and, and his preaching and how he has influenced other preachers like myself and for his passion and commitment and leadership in the area of church planting. Uh, so I'd encourage you, please, we, we would love it if you just continually prayed for us and for our church. A couple things you could pray for. We are now in this stage of trying to talk about and plan for us to plant another church there in Idaho. There is so much, so much growth in that area. It's not Orange County, just in case if you ever go to Idaho. Don't expect it to be like Orange County. There's not as many people there. Churches there aren't as big, so we need more churches there in Idaho. So pray for us in that, and also pray for our church to get our own space to worship and to do ministry and disciple making together. We actually just uh, last month are under contract for 17 acres of land there in the city of Meridian. But trust me, it's exciting, but it's also just the beginning of a long process, even just of due diligence to confirm things before that deal would close, and then the mountain that would be uh, building a building on that uh, property that can really house our growing church. So please pray for us in those things. But Pastor Mike did not ask me here today just to give you an update on what's going on in Idaho. He asked me to come and open up God's word with you guys. And so that's what we're going to do here this morning. And as we think about God's word, I want you to think about what are the questions we ask each other when we gather together here on a Sunday morning. When you see someone in this nice new lobby you guys have, uh, after service this morning, one of the questions you might ask them is, well, how was your week? And think about the answers you get to that question. If we were going family feud style up here on, on the board and saying, and the survey says, I'm guessing the number one answer would be good. You know, very informative, very helpful. How was your week? Oh, good. Uh, and I'm guessing the number two answer would be, oh, busy. It was a busy week. So next time somebody answers that question and tells you, oh, it was busy, I want you to ask them the question, busy with what? What, what were you busy with this week? Now imagine if you asked somebody that question and they came back at you with, I was, I was just so busy with joy this week. 
I was just so busy enjoying life this week. I think you would, you, if, unless they, it just seemed fake, if that really seemed authentic, you would probably listen to that and say, that sounds good. I should get busy with joy too. Uh, and what if I told you this morning that actually God wants you to be busy with joy? Now, some of you are thinking, did I accidentally walk into one of those like feel-good churches this morning? Or is this what happened to Pastor Ben when we shipped him off to Idaho? <laughs> I'm just telling you what God's word is telling you. And there are some very fair questions. You know, we, when, when something sounds that good, you should ask questions. Okay, what do we mean by that? And how do we get there? And that's where God's word is going to come in and give us the right answers to those questions. So please take your Bibles and open up to the book of Ecclesiastes with me. If you open up your Bible to the middle, you'll probably flop it open to the book of Psalms. So then just go two books over to the right, past Proverbs and two Ecclesiastes to chapter 5. And in some ways, this preaching is a little bit more of an update on what's been going on in Idaho. We have been able to preach through books like Uh, Colossians and Philippians and also the Gospel of John. Right now, we're just about in the middle of going through the book of Genesis together as a church. But one of the highlights of the first five years for our church was going through the whole book of Ecclesiastes uh, as as a church. Now, we took seven weeks to do, 17 weeks to do that as a church. I don't have that kind of time this morning, but I'm going to try to give you something of a flyover, something of a taste of the whole book of Ecclesiastes. I'm going to mention some other passages, but the only passages I'm going to ask you to turn to are here in the book of Ecclesiastes. The main passage we're going to look at is here in chapters 5 and 6, but we'll be moving around the book uh, quite a bit. So let's start with the first section of our passage, verses 8 through 17 here in chapter 5. Please listen along as I read. It says, if you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter. For the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is also a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture And he is the father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. And as he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again naked as he came and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. Now, if you look again closely at verse 16, if we had been going through the book of Ecclesiastes together, we would see some phrases there that would be familiar to us right now. For instance, this question he asks, what gain is there to him? Uh, That is a, a question he's asked now several times. You'll see a couple of these as we go through this, but by now you know the implied answer to that question is a strong no. And even the word gain is meant in a financial sense. What gain is there in your life? The answer is nothing. You gain nothing in this life because, as our text pointed out, you take nothing with you. So whatever you do in the middle, you end up in the same place that you were. That's how it works. As the old saying goes, you never see a U-Haul behind the hearse. So so what gain is there? There is nothing. And so when you're striving after all these things, you're toiling for the wind. It says, it was kind of breezy here yesterday. Did you try going outside and getting a fistful or two of the wind? How'd that go for you? It it doesn't. That's not how it works. You can't bottle up the wind. You can't grasp it in your hands. But that's what so many people uh, spend their lives doing when they're not going to be able to take any of it with them. And Solomon is taking aim here on a lot of these ideas. Let's go back to chapter 1. Now, I said Solomon. I believe Solomon, and most Bible scholars would agree, Solomon, who 
is the son of David, as it says here in chapter 1, verse 1, wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, but he doesn't refer to himself by name. He prefers throughout the book uh, the title preacher. That's what he calls himself in the book of Ecclesiastes, the preacher. And you see in chapter 1, verse 1, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And then he goes on to say a, a line that is very well known here in verse 2. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, we need to think about something very important here because some people translate this, this verse to basically mean the preacher is saying that life is meaningless and Ecclesiastes is a depressing book. And I am here to argue the exact opposite of that. Ecclesiastes is not a depressing book. It's actually a very encouraging book. And this vanity of vanities should not be interpreted to mean life is meaningless. I know you still use the English Standard Version here at uh, this church. And so if you look in your English Standard Version, you'll note there's a little note by the word vanity. And if you look down at the bottom of the page, you should see it's, it says the Hebrew term hebel, Translated vanity or vain refers concretely to a mist, vapor, or mere breath, and metaphorically to something that is fleeting or elusive. That's really what it means. Every time you see the word vanity in the book of Ecclesiastes, I want you to conjure up in your mind that image of mist, right? And that is, it's fleeting, it's elusive, it's there, and it's light, and then it is gone. When we preach through this book in Idaho, we called the series Getting the Most out of the mist. That's what the preacher is trying to help you see. Life is a mist. Here's how you get the most out of it. Here's how you do it right. That's what the preacher is uh, trying to show us, and that's what God is not trying to. He is showing us in this book. And then he starts uh, by bursting a lot of bubbles. You ever said that to anybody? Sorry to burst your bubble? The preacher here is saying, sorry, not sorry. I I'm going to burst some of your bubbles, because a lot of our bubbles need to be burst. I know that you would never consciously say this, because we all have some sense of our mortality, that we will die someday. But sometimes we do drift really into a mindset where we're operating like we are going to last forever. The preacher comes along, pop, no you won't. Verse four, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Any baby boomers in the room here this morning? Baby boomers, put your hands in the air. Don't be embarrassed of being a, a baby boomer. I've got good news and I've got bad news for you. What do you want to start with? Okay, you're not as bold as the other two services, but the right answer is the bad news. You always start with the bad news. And the bad news, baby boomers, is millennials are going to run the world someday. Now, I am smack dab in the middle of the millennial generation, and I'm scared of that fact. But the good news, baby boomers, is you won't be around to see it. Because a generation goes and a generation comes. Like, that's how it works. You're not going to last forever. You're going to be here. You're going to have your moment. And then it's going to be gone. And we do our church in a middle school, and so you, you walk around the campus and see all these motivational sayings and, and posters and things, things saying something to the effect of, you can change the world. The preacher of Ecclesiastes comes along, pop, no, you won't. You won't change the world. And you look at all that goes on in verses 5 and 6 and 7, and it's saying, no, the world's going to keep turning. The sun's going to rise and set every day. The rivers are going to keep flowing. The wind is going to keep blowing. And what has been, verse 9, is what will be. What has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. It was that way before you got here, and it'll be that way after you leave here. There, there is nothing new under the sun. You won't change the world and along those lines, many of us were tempted to think, well, what's my legacy going to be? And I want people to remember me. I guess there's some level of a biblical place for thinking about your legacy. Most accurately, thinking about how are we going to pass along the word to the next generation, whether you're a parent or a grandparent or just an older believer, how are we going to pass that on? But the idea, people are going to remember me, pop, probably not. 
for the, the high, high percentage of people in this room, if not all of us, the reality is about 100 years from now, there probably won't be one person on planet Earth that remembers your name. I, I think about my great-grandparents. About 100 years ago, they were in a very similar life stage to me. I never met them, and if I could characterize what I know about them in one word, it would be, it, it's misty. There were points in my life, I'm sure I was told about them. I remember where some of them come from. At this point in my life, I don't remember their names anymore. That's going to be me someday. That's going to be you someday. And you need to realize that now. If those bubbles are burst, you can actually operate with the right thoughts about life. Let's go back to chapter 5 now. Because now in our chapter, he's going to take aim on another bubble that needs to be burst. And if I could sum up this bubble in one word, it would be the word more. So write that down for point number one. If you're taking notes this morning, burst the bubble of more. Burst the bubble of more. This is one of the most seductive lies that the world will tell you. If I just had more fill in the blank, then life would be good or then life would be better. And we fill in the blank probably most frequently with money or the things that money can buy. But we also say things like, well, if I just had more time, if I just had more health, if I just had more friends, well, whatever you're tempted to fill in that blank with, it is a lie. If you think, well, if I just had that, then life would be good. More is a bad goal. The Bible elsewhere points that out to us. 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 and 10 says, but those who desire to be rich, those who want more, they fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Watch out for, even there, it says the desire to be rich. But here's the problem. It's, it's not the text's problem. It's our problem. Here's our problem with a passage like that. Just about every single one of us, we find a way to exempt ourselves from that. I don't want to be rich. Because the thinking generally goes something like this. Rich people have a lot more than I have. I only want a little more than I have. So I, this doesn't apply to me. You're falling into the trap. And even, let's just be a little self-aware, we're all in a room in Orange County, California here today, one of the most wealthiest places in the world. And you might say, well, yeah, I live here, but I don't live in Newport or I don't live in Nellie Gale. But you realize there's always someone on the other side of you in that? There's somebody this morning living in Riverside saying, well, I don't live in Orange County, right? There's always somebody on the other side saying, well, you've got more than I do. So when you're looking at the other side saying, well, I don't have what they have, you're just falling for the rat race of the world. And you need to realize, no, this warning applies to me and I need to watch out for it into my own life and it's a trap. And in our passage now, it gives us several reasons why it's a trap. Look at that first section, verses eight and nine. If you're wondering, why are we starting talking about oppression of the poor and violation of justice and righteousness? And what is it talking about, the higher official and a higher and a higher? Well, let's just think about it this way. What's tomorrow, April 15th? Tax day. Do you ever get frustrated by how much you pay in taxes I was expecting a more audible yes. I guess you're not a very honest crowd um, <laughs> this morning. Yes, you are. And do you ever get frustrated at times that you feel some of your tax dollars get misused and wasted? Yes, you do. There's nothing new under the sun, guys. That's been going on all the existence of humanity because there's a higher official and a higher one over them and everyone needs their cut and everyone needs to fund their program and it's amazing how inefficient you can be when you're spending someone else's money for something that you won't use. That's the world that we live in. And so if you're frustrated that some of your money gets wasted by someone else, that's the way it always has been. That's the way it always will be, or at least usually, maybe every once in a while, you'll get a king committed to cultivated fields. That's a good thing, but you get the sense from this that's probably more the exception than the rule. And, and so if you're grasping after more, that means, well, you've got more. You're in a higher tax bracket, so more of your stuff is going to be wasted by other people. 
And when the economy takes a downturn, and, and really your wealth then shrinks, you lose value and wealth in that downturn. Is that your fault? No, it's usually because of the actions of other people for all kinds of reasons. More is not as secure as you think it is. Verse 10 reminds us that more is an impossible destination. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. Did you ever get in the car as you're going somewhere and you plug in your, your destination on your phone or in your car in the navigation system and it gives you your ETA and you think, all right, that's when we're going to be there. And then you get on the road and pff, traffic and you're sitting there and, and that ETA is just going up, 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 up. And you're sitting in a parking lot on the 405 with nowhere to grow and you feel that tension just rising in you. Do you enjoy that feeling? I don't. I don't enjoy that feeling. If you're looking for more and think that's what's going to satisfy you, you're signing up for a lifetime of that feeling because the destination is always going to be getting farther and farther away and you will never arrive. People don't like it when the goalposts get moved. If you keep seeking after more, the goalposts are going to be moving farther away from you for as long as you live. It's impossible. And verse 11 says, when goods increase, they increase who eat them. It tells us that more money actually leads to more problems. Mo money, mo problems. A rapper didn't come up with that idea in the 1990s. It's been in the Bible for 3,000 years. And, and think about it. It is true. But let's think about this seduction of more, and let's think about a fantasy that probably every single one of us has had at some point in our lives. You, you think, man, if I could just have that one good idea. I could just have that one good idea. Maybe you're watching that TV show Shark Tank or something like that where you see someone, they had a good idea, and now they're making millions. If I could just have that one good idea, I could you know, pay for a church plant, set up my kids, and then buy myself a nice house and retire. I could do all of that if I just had that one nice idea. Oh, really? Let's just play that out a little bit. Let's say you have this good idea. You start selling this good idea. It actually is successful. You know what you're going to need? You're going to need to hire more people to help you. So then you're going to have to manage those people. And that's not always the easiest thing in the world. And then usually, if it's a really good idea, the demand for your idea is going to be bigger than you have the capacity to provide. So then you're going to need to go ask people for money. And they're going to now own some of your business. It's not just yours anymore. And maybe someday you'll go public and you'll have all kinds of stockholders like some of you people to answer to. And, and all of that will happen just so you can get more money to feed the demand. And then you're going to need an accountant to keep track of all that money. You're going to need to hire a lawyer and pay them an expensive retainer for the inevitable moment when your good idea is stolen or knocked off by somebody else. You're going to need all of those things. And that nice house you get to retire, you're probably going to need someone to keep it clean, someone to maintain the property for you. There's going to be all kinds of complications in your life if you have that one good idea. See, that one good idea isn't maybe as good as it sounded five minutes ago because more doesn't provide all that it promises. In fact, it often brings with it complications. Even just as we were going through the book of Ecclesiastes, somebody gave us uh, the gift of a nice new espresso machine for our house. And whenever you get something nice and new, you realize, oh, this is, this is great. This is nice. You know what? The, these Costco beans we've been buying, they're not cutting it anymore. We, we need nicer beans for this. And you know, we need to take care of this nice thing. Like nice things demand more nice things and, and more upkeep and and cost more money to keep them nice. See how it just keeps moving the goalposts? Do you see how it actually brings a lot of things that are complications? And you think, if I just had a little more, then I would sleep well at night. No, verse, verse 12, sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. I was born here in South Orange County, and my dad, he's one of the pastors now up at Compass HB, and at that time in his life, he was in the commercial banking world, and so he would spend all day here in, in Orange County working with clients, and he said when he was around these guys, they, you could tell they were stressed. I mean, they were wealthy by worldly standards, but they were stressed because they were mortgaged and leveraged to the hilt, and he'd spend all day around them, and then he would drive home, and every day he'd drive home past El Niguel Country Club right as the grounds crew was wrapping up their day, and he would look at those guys who 
clearly were not as wealthy as the people he'd been working for all day, but those people sure look a lot happier. They look like their life is a lot less stressful than the people who have more that I've been working with all day. Money can't deliver rest or security. It promises that it will, but it can't because there is no investment that's a sure thing. There is nothing that can't be lost. And that's the story that you see then in verses 13 through 17. It tells a story of a man. As one commentator, he says, this man spoiled his life twice over, first in the getting and then in the losing. So he ruins his life to get more. Look at verse 17. All his days he eats in darkness and much vexation and sickness and anger. He's stressed out getting all this stuff. So he ruins his life that way. And then he ruins it all because he loses it. He loses it. Spare yourself from the sad ending of that story. And how do you do that? You need to start being on the lookout in your own mind. Whenever you start getting that sense, if I just had more whatever, then life would be better, then life would be good. I hope now there are alarm bells and red lights going off in your head. Watch out. It's a lie. Don't fall for it. Don't believe it. There's no happy ending down that road. Now, all I've told you basically this morning to burst the bubble of more, I've I've told you what not to do. And and that can be a little bit depressing. And this is one of those areas in life where stop it is not good enough. One thing growing up in my family, we, one of the things that I would do with my dad and my brothers, we would play golf together. My dad taught us all how to play and we would play these public courses in San Antonio, Texas growing up. And, And on one of those courses, there was a shot where you tee off and you got to hit right over a lake to the green. And if you play golf, you know this. Even if you don't, you can probably understand this. Whenever you're playing, and especially if you're a young golfer and you've got that shot over the water, this is how it goes. Don't hit it in the water. Don't hit it in the water. Don't hit it in the water. Do you know what you end up doing nine times out of ten? You hit it in the water. My dad, he knew what he was doing. He's really good. Uh, he wasn't even thinking about the water. He was focused on the target. And so now what I want to do is, what's the, what's the target to aim for? And that's really what verses 18 through 20 are there in Ecclesiastes 5. Another way to think about these verses, they're very much the chorus of the book of Ecclesiastes. Think about the songs we sang this morning. You, you sing a verse, and the lyrics are different in each verse, and then you come back to the chorus, and it's the same lyrics again. There's basically a chorus to the book of Ecclesiastes. It comes back, the words that we're going to read here, we've already seen a few times in the book of Ecclesiastes. It keeps coming back to these words. They're so important. Listen to them them now as I read verses 18 through 20. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. That's where the title of this message comes from, right there at the end of verse 20. God keeps him occupied. Another way to say that, God keeps him busy with joy. Now, here's the question. Who is it that God keeps busy with joy? The rich, the famous, the powerful? No, the people that eat and drink and enjoy their toil. Doesn't that sound like what you spend most of the days of your life doing, eating and drinking and toiling? I mean, isn't that the, the, the business and the better part of Every waking day, you got to figure out, what am I going to do and what am I going to eat? And that's your life. And God says, the ones that are busy with joy are the ones that take those things every day and and savor them and enjoy them as a gift from God. Let's put it down this way for point number two. Get busy savoring God's daily gifts. Get busy savoring God's daily gifts. There's a difference between chewing something and savoring something. The most exciting thing going on in Idaho is what God is doing in in building his church there. But one of the other cool things that's going on in Idaho is that just a few months ago, they opened up the first In-N-Out Burger in the state of (laughs) Idaho. 
common grace wins again, right? What a beautiful thing. And let me tell you, that first bite I had of Idaho in and out, I savored every molecule of that bite because it was special. And what the text is saying here is that's how you should eat every bite of everything you eat every day of your life. And this is where we come back to that. How is this, you know, a distinctly Christian message? Couldn't I go to Barnes and Noble after the service and probably find some book telling me to to save her life and stop grasping for more? Yeah, you probably could, but I guarantee you, it's not going to be as good as Ecclesiastes, because pop psychology can't really get you here. Sociology can't get you here. It takes theology. It takes a right understanding of God to really have this perspective. Look again at verses 18 through 20 and just scan around what word do you notice the most in those three verses. The most common word there is God. God is mentioned four times in those three verses, and three of the four times, God is linked with the word given or gift. You you see that? All of the days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. So if you really want to get the most out of the mist, if you really want to be busy with joy, you need the right view of God. Because without that, you're not going to get there. And the book of Ecclesiastes shows us two things. If you want to write down two more things, under point two, two things you need to have in your mind about God. The first one is you need to trust God. And this connects to an idea theologians refer to as the providence of God. And if you think about that word, you notice how providence begins with the word provide, that God provides, God gives us what we need. It's even built upon and it's stronger than just the idea of the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God teaches us that God can do whatever he wants. He's he's all powerful. Nothing can stop him. He is the king. But the providence of God reminds us that God's sovereignty has a purpose. He, He has a plan for what he is doing. And that plan is connected to his goodness. He's a good and generous king. He's also a wise king. He knows what he is doing. And the more you learn to trust those realities, the more busy with joy that you will be. Uh, Go back to chapter 3 with me. This is perhaps the most well-known passage in Ecclesiastes because uh, you can find songs, not just worship songs, sacred and secular songs that draw from Uh, this poetry here at the beginning of chapter 3, and it begins by saying, for everything there is a season. Now, after living in Idaho for several years, I feel like I need to pause and put a footnote in about what seasons are. There's four of them, winter, spring, summer, and fall. I know you only get one of them here in uh, Southern California. You're thinking, no, we get winter. Come visit me next December, and we'll show you a little more about what winter is like. So we have four very distinct seasons in Idaho, and generally, people think of some seasons more favorably than others. For instance, more people are going to like the summer. We get so much daylight in Idaho. It is, it's incredible. It's enjoyable. It's warm, and it is light as opposed to the winter where it is cold and it is dark. The sun doesn't come up until after 8 o'clock in the morning. And so you think, oh, summer, good. Give me that summer. Oh, winter, when will it be over? And if you look at all the pairings in verse 2 through 8, most of them we think of one of them as positive and one of them as negative. There's a time to be born and a time to die. I've been to lots of birthday parties. I've never been to a death day party. Or all the way down to verse 8, a time to love. Oh, that's good. And a time to hate. Ooh, I don't like that. A time for war. No, 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 no war, thank you. A time for peace. Yes, I want peace. 
But, but then verse 9 comes back to this question we already saw a couple times. What gain has the worker from his toil? Implied answer, nothing. I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. So you see there, the good seasons and the bad seasons, God is working them all out for a purpose. He has made everything beautiful in its time. God has a plan for your life. It really, it's a bigger thing than just us. Ephesians 1 reminds us God is working all things according to the counsel of his will. We can trust the providence of God. We can trust that he is putting this puzzle of our lives and really the, the puzzle of history all together. And maybe you think about that idea of putting a puzzle together. Maybe you've done that as a family on a vacation or over a holiday where you clear off one of the tables and you dump out the pieces and you start with the borders and you start to fill it out. That's basically what God is doing with all of time. He's putting it all together into something beautiful. The, the problem is, your perspective, it's as if God is doing this on a glass table, and your vantage point is you're on your back, lying on the floor, looking up through the bottom of the table. God's put eternity in your heart. You have a sense God's doing something, but you don't know exactly what it is. You don't know how it's all shaping up. And you look, why, 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 is, God, why is God filling out those pieces over there. I, why doesn't he do more right here? He knows what's going on. We don't have the full picture. So we have to trust that he does. We have to trust that he is powerful. We have to trust that he is wise. We have to trust that he is good, even in the bad seasons of life. And that's where I just want to tell you, if you're thinking, oh, busy with joy, that sounds good, but I'm, I'm just in too difficult of a season. I, I'm just suffering too much in my life right now. Pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. Well, that may be fair. I may not have been through what you're going through, but I can say being a pastor has given me a front row seat for a lot more suffering than, than most people. I see people go through suffering all the time, and I see the people that go through some suffering and come out the other side okay, and even come out the other side stronger than they were before, and I see people go through suffering and, and maybe never really make it out of there with their faith intact or, or strong. And you know what the difference is? The people that go through, well, they're doing this. Even in the midst of their suffering, they're savoring God's daily gifts every day. That they're, as the hymn writer said, they're tracing the rainbow through the rain the whole time, observing the goodness of God. And, and they go through it stronger. And the people that don't, let me just tell you, I've seen it, you might make it through the sickness that you're through. You, you might get through the trial that you're through, but if you don't embrace God's daily goodness, you may never make it out of the bitterness that develops in your heart. And don't let that gain a foothold in your life. Remember God's goodness. Trust that in every season, even when you don't know what God is up to. Notice then in verse 12 there in chapter 3, it gets back to the chorus. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in his toil. This is God's gift to man. Only when you trust the providence of God can you sing that chorus really from your heart that there is nothing better than to savor the daily gifts of God. Now there's another aspect of theology that you need in order to live this out. Not only do you need to trust God, you need to fear God. And that's another critical concept in the book of Ecclesiastes. Turn now to the end of the book with me, to chapter 12. Go to chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. And this is the landing point. Uh, this is the punchline of the whole book. Man, my landing yesterday at John Wayne, that pilot smacked that plane down on the ground. <laughs> And that's a little bit how the preacher comes down for a landing here at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. The end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Smack, right? That's it. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. These are such important words for us to hear. 
And I know you have a faithful pastor in a world where everyone wants to maybe avoid or downplay the fear of God. I know that's something that is faithfully taught here at this church, and it's for our good, and it's for a reason. Verse 14, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. We will all stand before God someday, and that should change our perspective. And that will change your perspective from an essentially self-centered outlook where life is all about me and my satisfaction to a God-centered outlook that my life is entirely about pleasing the Lord. That's why I live. If you think that way, you can get busy with joy. If it's all about yourself, you will never be. And you will never be satisfied. And that's why you need to fear the Lord. And this is where this all comes back to the central idea of everything that we believe as Christians, the good news of Jesus Christ. Because on our own, knowing that we will stand before God as judge someday should strike fear into all of our hearts. None of, the, none of us are ready for that on our own. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We need a substitute. And that's where the good news of Jesus Christ comes in. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he lived the perfect life that none of us have lived. He died on the cross to take the punishment that your sin deserves and my sin deserves, and he rose again so that we could have new and eternal life. And the central message of the Bible is repent, turn from your sin, turn from seeking after your own selfish ways, and trust in Christ, the substitute, the Savior, the King, and the Lord. And if you're new to church or someone has invited you today or you've just come here searching for something today, that's what you need to start with. Knowing who Jesus is, turning from your sin, and putting your faith in him. Because if you haven't done that, nothing else I've said today will work. It all starts with Jesus Christ. But if you come to know him, and you trust God, and you fear God, now you can savor God's daily gifts. Now you can get busy, truly, with joy. I love talking about the book of Ecclesiastes, partly because, if I could say this, I don't think I've ever had so much fun uh, preaching through a book of the Bible. I mean, I I told all the baby boomers that they were going to die, and they laughed, right? That's that's Ecclesiastes. It it says things in a unique way. There's no other book of the Bible that's just quite like it. It, it's, It's unique among the voices in The scriptures. I also love talking about Ecclesiastes because this is a book that God used in such a mighty way in my own life when I was in a season of life that I did not enjoy. And God used this book to wake me up and to turn me around. The first time I ever seriously looked at the book of Ecclesiastes, I was a junior in high school in San Antonio, Texas. And I'm the youngest of three brothers. One of my brothers was off in college, and one of my brothers had just gotten married. And I looked at their lives and I said, Boy, that looks fun. But being a high schooler in Texas and filling my days with calculus and chemistry and physics, this is boring. My life is lame right now. But pretty soon I'll go to college. That looks fun. And then hopefully I can get married. That seems pretty great. But I'm just, I'm just looking ahead and hoping that things get better. I was meeting with uh, one, my youth group leader every Tuesday morning for breakfast tacos. And one week he showed up with this book, Be Satisfied by Warren Wearsby. It was a commentary through Ecclesiastes, and we read that together, and God used it to change my mind and and to convict me to realize that the way that I was living was was wrong. It was foolish. It it was showing I wasn't trusting God, and, and I wasn't fearing God to just be looking for the next season of life instead of making the most of the season I was in. And that wasn't just a, you know, hey, let's, let's think better, let's think good thoughts, good vibes only. No, it was, it was theological. I had a wrong view of God that was leading me to a wrong view of life. And if you're in a season like that, I hope this message changes your mind this morning. One of the quotes in that book that's actually commenting on our passage in chapter five, Warren Wearsby writes, don't plan to live, start living now. Be satisfied with what God gives you and use it all to his glory. I'm trying to show you guys something here that's a win-win. When you live life this way, you win, that you end up enjoying life more, and it's a win for God because he's glorified. He's honored. Look at that person. They're they're trusting me. They're, They're fearing me. See, that's how you're designed to live. And when you don't do this, it's a lose lose because your life is ruined with bitterness and discontentment, and God is not honored in that. And notice again what our text says. It doesn't say 
Go and get an enjoyable job. It says, enjoy the job that you have. Now, is there ever a time in life to make changes or to get a new job or to move somewhere? Yeah, yeah. there can be reasons to do that, but if the motive ever really truly fueling that is, well, just more or something different will make my life good, watch out. I've seen it now many times. Discontent Californians turn into discontent Idahoans because a change in circumstances can't change your heart. Get your heart right. Get your view of God right. And then your perspective will change and everything will change along with that. And I want you to just think about just what does a normal morning look like for you? Do you just savor those daily gifts? Do you get to get up? I don't know. Do you go outside and go on a walk on a cool California morning? Do you savor that as a gift from God? Do you drink a nice cup of coffee with, with gratitude for, for the generosity of God as you drink it? Do you take a warm shower, one of God's just simple blessings that he has given to humanity? Do you, do you soak all those things up? And if you're a Christian, does not God's word say that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ? Do you savor those? Do you savor his, his mercies every morning? Do you cherish the opportunity to get alone with God and his word and prayer and really soak those things up as, gift of, as gifts of God? That is how God wants you to live. And when you live that way, every day you'll get to the end of your life and say, man, I've been busy with joy. Let's just look a little more at how this works. Go to chapter 9 with me. Let's just try to get really practical and, and drill this in. Verse 7 expresses beautifully so much of, of what we have said. Go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Go enjoy your lunch today, people, as a gift from God. Cherish it. Verse 8, let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Now, what's going on with white garments and oil? Those were things for special occasions. You don't wear the white garments every day when you're just going out and working in the field, unless you don't want them to be white for very long. These are special things, but notice it says, let your garments be always white. Let oil be, not be lacking on your head. It's another way of saying, make every occasion a special occasion when you're viewing it all as a gift from God because you're trusting him and you're fearing him. Let's just think about today to get very practical and concrete for you. Don't fall into the temptation, well, all I'm, I'm, today I'm just going to church and then going home and taking a nap. Let's just, let's just stop there. Just going to church? Let's never get to a point in the Christian life where we start thinking about it that way. Just going to church? What a privilege it is to gather with the people of God in the house of God to sing the praises of God and to hear the word of the living God. These are special things. Every time you walk through these doors, it should be special. And then I would make, I mean, a lesser argument, but an important argument, just taking a nap? Come on. Let's go make that the best nap that's ever been napped in the history of the world. God made Sunday afternoons for a purpose, people, and it involves napping, okay? I'm, and all God's people said, Husbands, listen to me now. Look at verse 9. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain, misty life that God has given you under the sun because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Husbands, enjoy life with your wife. And if your first thought with that is, I wish my wife was more enjoyable, I just want you to know that's the problem. That thought is the problem. And that thought goes against everything the book of Ecclesiastes has been telling you today. And if that's really what you're thinking, what you need to do is you need to go home today. You probably need to get alone with God and you need to get down on your knees and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've been thinking that way about one of the most precious gifts that you've given me. And I repent, God. Thank you for giving me what I don't deserve. And I wanna cherish what you've given me. And then, husband, you probably need to go leave your closet and go tell basically the same thing to your wife. And you need to resolve today, I'm going to enjoy the wife that I love all the misty days of my life. I'm going to make the most of it with her. Or young people, now you can perk up. Go to chapter 11 with me in verse 9. 
I'm just going to read the Bible here. This is, what, this is the word of the Lord. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. Go enjoy life, young people. Soak up all the good things that God has given you to do while you are young and healthy and able to do those things. Obviously, remember, we're not talking about sin. We're not talking about straying from the commandments of God because, one, that's not actually fun. It may be for a moment, but then it'll get really, really bad, right? God has created so much good, so much to enjoy in this world. Get after it while you're young, and and that's a lesson that I'll translate to every season because even if you're thinking, well, I'm not young anymore, well, you're as young as you'll ever be again. And if you keep this mindset all through your life, you'll have something that not all the money in the world could buy. You'll have a truly godly perspective, and God will keep you busy with joy. Now, we'll fly through this last part. Go back with me to chapter 6 now. And part of the reason we'll fly through it is chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, is saying a lot of the same things as chapter 5, verses 8 through 17 were, the structure of this text is what commentators refer to as a chiasm. It's kind of a, a pyramid where everything builds to this central point. It makes a bunch of arguments leading to the central point, and then it kind of says the same things going away from the point. So many of this, much of this will be very similar to what we've already seen. Uh, chapter 6, verse 1, there is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind, a man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, so that the years of his life are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it, the child comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to the one place. All the toil of a man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. And what advantage has the wise man over the fool? And what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. You see, that there's some stories in there that are similar to the story we saw in chapter 5 of the man who ruins his life twice. You get these stories of people that they have everything, whether it's wealth, whether it's kids, whether it's long life, but if they don't, or if they're not given by God the ability to enjoy it, if I could just summarize that whole stretch, what a waste. What a waste to have so much, but not enjoy it. Point number three, avoid the waste of discontentment. Avoid the waste of discontentment. Uh, So much of that is really summarized there in that last verse, verse 9. Better is the sight of the eyes. Better is enjoying what God has put right in front of you than the wandering of the appetite. Because if you wander after your appetite, you'll never find it, and you'll look back and you'll say, what a waste. And that's what I want to spare you from. That's what the book of Ecclesiastes wants to spare you from, from getting to the end of your life and looking back and saying, what did I do with all that God has given to me? Because if you go back to where I was, so many people never learn the lesson of Ecclesiastes, and this is how life goes. They're in high school, and they're saying, man, life will be better when I get to college. And then like two weeks into college, you start asking, well, when do I graduate here? (laughs) Then life will be good. And you graduate, and you say, well, well, I really want to be married and have one to to share life with. And so then you, you get married and you think, well, now we're married. We should kind of get stable. Let's, let's scrimp and save and, and buy a house. Then, th- then, you know, we can relax and life will be good. And then you buy a house and you say, well, now we should probably fill the house. Let's get after having some, some kids. And I don't even know if that's the right order to do things, but so many people uh, do that. Well, now let's fill the house. And then pretty soon after having kids, when's the house going to be empty again? And you start looking forward to that next season. And then all the kids are gone. The house is empty and you're still working. And you'll say, man, well, it'll finally be nice when I can retire. And then you retire and the next thing you know, you're dead. (laughs) 
But before you die, you will look back at your life with regret and say, what did I do with it? I wasted it. I never enjoyed where God had put me because I didn't trust him. I didn't fear him. It was all about me. And I I regret it. And I want to spare you from that. I want your life to have a different ending. I want you to someday be on your deathbed and look back. Hopefully that's many, many years from now. And you look back and instead you say, where is all the time gone? I've just been so busy with joy. And God has been so good to me every single step of the way in every season. Isn't that how you want to live your life? Isn't that how you want to end your life? That's where you want to be in the end. It's going to start with how you live today. Are you going to walk out of here and trust God and fear God and enjoy every good thing he gives you today? Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for your word that whether we're in Orange County, California, or in Idaho, or in Uganda, or in the, in the Middle East, or whether we're in the year 2024, or whether we're uh, centuries behind us, or decades into the future, however long you give us, your word is good, your word is true, your word is eternal. And it is always so good for us to learn from your word. God, would you please use your word today to transform our lives? Would you please use your word today to change how we think? God, would you use your word to change how we live? God, I wanna pray for every single one of us that we would someday at the end of our lives be able to look back and say, you've been so good and we've been so busy with joy. But to get there, God, help us to leave here today. And whether we're going to things that we think are exciting or not, or even if we're walking in this week to things that are painful, pray that you would help us to savor everything that you give us because we trust you, we fear you, we love you, Lord. We pray all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.